Ladies and Jacksonville Podcast, everybody! Hey. Thank you again for your company wherever you are. Where are you? Are you in the gym? Ah, uh, you could be. This is a health and fitness podcast after all. Are uh, you making dinner for the kids, maybe? Are you driving? Wherever you are, genuinely thank you very much for joining us for the show. My guest today is an author, he's a TV star, footballer, and he's even been in a movie. He's the most famous best after George himself. Yes, of course, I can only be talking about the one and only. Let's give it up. It's Callum Best. Hey. Callum Best has joined us yes, brother. for our podcast. Really appreciate you you coming on Kat there's so much to get through and I know we're not going to even touch the surface yeah. and there's a few guests that we have on that I know it's going to be a double episode yep. so at some point we come you know back. season three we come back because almost where do you start yep. as your terminology is you went from dark to light mm-hmm. and your stories were recorded mm-hmm. but for those that don't know mm-hmm. so in terms of because you haven't always been juicing it into your health. I mean, you look phenomenal. You're 39 years of age. You've been recording this. Health is a huge part, but it never used to be. So what did the Callum Best Day used to look like? Well, I had to turn to health (laughs) because otherwise it would have ended grim. But funny enough, my juicing came before the darkness came because when I grew up in California, I remember when shots of wheatgrass first came to the table because I think California was one of the first places that I knew. And how long ago are we talking I mean, I was probably 15, 16. I'm 39 now, so 15, 16. I remember hearing about these shots of wheatgrass in California. There was a little juice bar down near Zuma Beach where I lived. They used to make smoothies, and I remember they had the little plants out with the little grass that they grew. You'd go in there, and someone would say, oh, it's the equivalent of 500,000 pounds of vegetables. (laughs) And I'd be like, well, I don't eat these things at home, so I might as well drink them in this place. And so I remember I started on wheatgrass a long time ago, but my mom is a health nut. She's a nutritionist. She was always a step ahead of the game when it came to knowledge on health and alternative ways. And so I knew about it at a young age. Moved to London, found a pub, found a nightclub, and the juicing went out the window. Okay, different kind of juice. Yeah, completely completely different different kind of juice. juice. My juice was actually cranberry (laughs) mixed with (laughs) vodka. No, it wasn't. It was even worse than that. But... Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I was health and fitness in California where I grew up. That's very much a, a lifestyle for people in California. I grew up on the beach. It was very much health-driven, and, and I lived a pretty good life. I was active. I loved football. You know, I took pretty good care of myself. I moved to London when I was 20, 21 years old. And in short, I got here on a good buzz. I moved here because of my old man, and bless him, he was ill at the time, and I knew I had limited time. So I packed up my stuff in California. I moved to the UK. Like you said, we could be here for five hours yeah, minimum course, talking yeah, about this yeah. stuff. But in short, I, I moved here to spend time with my dad. I was lucky that fresh off the boat, I started working as well. I was doing some great shoots with Burberry and you know British Vogue, and things were going really, really well. And I remember one night, I went to a nightclub once, and I ran into a friend of mine named Jake, and he said, ooh, I was friends with your father back in the 60s, 70s, 80s. I've just opened this new nightclub, come down. And I'm like, ooh, I'm so welcome. I love it. Went down to his nightclub, and I was sucked in. And I remember my PR agent said, Callum, work is going really well for you. Don't get caught up in this stuff. And I went, no, no, I won't. Don't worry. Don't worry. Cut to three years later, I'm still in the same nightclub. The agency had dropped me. I was overweight. I was unhealthy. I was reputation tarnished. Pretty dark times. Was that mainly down to drink or food? Or I mean, did, did it drink was, play a huge part? I know people often try and tie that in yeah. because of your father. Obviously, I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah. So people often do that because, uh, and I know now you're, you're very much involved in a, in a charity that deals with sons, daughters, etc. of alcoholics. Yeah, of course. I know you're very much involved in that. Yeah. But did you find that it was getting you as well? Did you find that it was taking a grip or not really? I mean, th- there's a lot to say here, but what I found was I was by myself, you know, my mom was back in America. I have a really small family. I just had my mom and my dad. My mom was the health side. My dad, sadly, as genius as he was on the football pitch, as a father, was a drinker, you know. And so I came here and I tried to build a relationship with my dad. But by then, the alcohol had taken over so much of him that he was really, really ill. Yeah, we talked about football. We talked about girls. That was the extent of it. You know, our relationships consisted of, sadly, he was such a drinker that it was 8 in the morning in the pub, the Feeney, till, you know, 9 o'clock at night. And that was every single wow. day, yeah. So most of the time I spent with my dad was in the pub or at football. I mean, being young and new to the UK and really accepted into this kind of nightlife scenario, I had no friends and I knew that nightlife and the club owners and the people involved in the kind of darkness welcomed me with open arms, right? <laughs> yeah, and, and I actually really, really liked it at the time. And I mean, I look back at some of my memories and they're mind-blowingly good and fun. But having an addictive personality, having a lot of things in me that, you know, don't know when to stop, I found myself in these places every single day, every single night. You know, I was drinking a bottle of Jack and night. I was getting on wow. all, Yeah, I was getting on all all sorts a night, of, a yeah. bottle of Jack and night. Easy, easy wow. for a long time. But when you're 23, 24 years old, I mean, that filters out through your system and you're ready to go the next day, no problem, sure, yeah. you know? And I found myself in these environments, you know, and 
when I first got here, the work was there. And then once I started the nightlife circuit and started drinking and not eating well and not juicing, for example, and just choosing alcohol and drugs over the kind of healthy lifestyle, it really took its toll. You know, my hair went, my weight came massively, my reputation got tarnished. So when I got here from 20 to 23, I was just enjoying what a young man would. Yeah. When my dad passed, I found escapism and masking my way of dealing with it by drinking and partying. So I spent from 24 till about 27, 28, just going all out. And I remember thinking to myself, I was, I felt this massive pressure of being my dad's son and not really knowing how to cope with it and thinking, oh my God, my dad's an icon loved by many. What do I do? They don't like me. If I can't play football, I've got to choose the next best option. Ah, I know what I can do as good as my dad. I can party. I can womanize. Yeah. So I went down that road and I had a great time doing it. (laughs) Don't get me wrong, but it got me absolutely nowhere. Some great memories, but when it comes to what I'm so passionate about now, which is helping other people that might be in the same position as I am, taking care of my health, passing on all the tools you learn over the years to coming out of this dark place into a light one, that that's such a passion of mine. This is why I'm really glad you're on the podcast, because for a lot of people that don't know, and this is the challenge you have due to the years that, like you said, you were partying and so on. And given some of the TV that you've done Mm. and and various other bits, the people I would argue heavily don't know the real Callum Best. I mean, as corny as that sounds, they don't know the work you do for charities and the genuine passion that you have Mm. for health in particular. I mean, you've gone the other way. You said you've got addictive personality. You can see it. (laughs) Yeah, but now it's going towards a positive area, Mm. isn't it? In terms of, you know, encouraging people to get healthy, to juice. Like you said, your mom's been into it for Mm. God knows how many years and so on. I'm trying to get a time frame here because I remember watching the very first Love Island. It was called Celebrity Love Island. Mm. I remember watching that. And I remember, I think it was Paul Denner. I can't remember. Yeah. But I remember him, alcohol, playing a huge part in there. It would turn him mm. massively in mm. there. For those that are listening, they haven't seen it, but it was very different to what Love Island is now. And there were celebrities on there and so on. But he got violent on mm. that. I mean, he was really violent on there. Were you still in your party mode during that time? Oh, or was yeah. It, no, that, that was, was actually pre-party. That was like okay. my first television show. I was 23 and oh, so I was, you were 20, I was trying to get a timeline. Okay, yeah. fine. Now so, I understand. So my, my old man, so I hate to say this, but my beginning of the extreme downward hill was after my old man passed. Yeah, of right? course. Before that, I was just living. You know, okay. I was like, ooh, <laughs> this is good life, right? I'm fresh to the UK. They've welcomed me in. I remember at one point seeing something on the cover of some paper. It was like they didn't even know George Best had a son, yeah? And they were like, ooh, Bestie's got a kid. Let's focus on here. Okay. And I remember I went to these GQ Awards, and I was pictured with Caprice, and Caprice was a massive model at the time, and it was the front cover of the sun. And I remember being like, oh, I'll take that. I love <laughs> this stuff, right? Then you realize 10 years later when they slate you every single day that you're like, yeah. hold on, the tabloids aren't for me. But I got more stories about that at some other time. But uh, there were so many years, right? So at first it was just, uh, oi, Callum likes a night out, you know, following his dad's footsteps, blah, blah, blah. And I didn't mind it. Playboy didn't mind it. I was 23, 24, whatever, yeah? And I was working and things were good. But then it turned to like CD. Then it turned to Lothario. Then it turned to what does it actually say on his passport? Just George Best's son. What is this guy actually doing here? He's a waste of space. It went down all these roads and it killed me on the inside. Like my self-belief was at the all-time low. I remember not thinking I was going to make it till 30 years old. Like all of the darkness was in those times, you know, but there was little tools that I started to do over the years after that. You know, I made a documentary for the BBC called Brought Up by Booze, and it was a turning point in my life where I learned that I wasn't alone. I learned about grieving. I learned about charities that help kids who struggle with alcohol in the family. And it was just these kind of different tools that, you know, when, at 26, 27, 28 that I started to put into play that got me to the point that I am now, you know? Because the book that you wrote, because you wrote Second Best, yeah. I think the book that you wrote, and it took you four years. Yeah. To write that book. That's and right. Presumably that was an incredibly cathartic experience as well, a bit like the documentary, I yeah. guess. In, in other words, it helped you to heal, I suppose, in some respects. Massively. It's like therapy, isn't it? You know, I mean, I, I think my mom tells me still to this day I need therapy, but I don't listen. I don't go to it. <laughs> but I think that something like a book and, you know, I had a choice, man. It, I had reached such a low because nobody really knew my story and didn't care about my story. They just cared about George Best being an icon. And they just thought that Callum was a waste of space son that just spent his money and didn't give a shit. When realistically, my dad, bless him, went bankrupt twice, left me no money. It was actually more of a, you know, I felt quite damaged what I was left with and what I was See, given. You know, a lot of people didn't know that I saw you on Celebrity Big Brother, actually. And mm. I remember you sitting in the garden and actually you were talking about that very subject. Mm. And I remember that I didn't know, a lot of people didn't know mm. that at that point. 
you know, like in other words, he's dining out on his dad and all this yeah. kind of stuff. But actually, it was when you started talking as you're doing now, yeah. you weren't dining out. There was nothing to dine out on. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's- well, people just assume, and I and I get it though. So like, I can't really hold any grudges, but it's all about trying to just first of all educate and open people's mind. And that was a big part of my book because I wanted to say anybody that wants to know about me or has any kind of interest, then here is something for you to learn about me. Yeah. And what I found out is that it initially started by wanting others to accept me, but then it became about acceptance of myself. And it was a point of me really learning to get my self-belief back and really, you know, what I did was I put these things out there that I'd never talked about to say to people, you think you might've known like, you know, but you don't. And I was traumatized for this reason. And I turned to that for that reason. And I went down that dark path for that reason. And, And still to this day, even when I'm so comfortable in my own skin, I always have to kind of give a second answer of, you know, those times were masking my pain and people were like, well, rubbish, that's not a good enough excuse. But it's like, well, that was my excuse. That was my reason at the time, you know? On the intro to all of my podcasts, Mm -hmm. I always say the second most famous after, like Lorraine was on my podcast, I said the second most famous Lorraine after Quiche. Yeah. Right? So it was one of those. (laughs) And then when when it came to you, it was like, well, of course, when you think of best, there's only one, and that is your father, essentially, to call your book second best. And then we were talking another time, I've known you for years, but this everything has to have best in the title. And I was saying, because you're so into health at the moment, that, you know, the best of health would be the title of the health book that you would have. But it's always best, best, best. So, you know, it's... Well, there's I have so many things to say about that. It's like, you know, even to this day, it was my birthday yesterday. And even to this day, some guy who was a big Manchester United fan, probably from my dad's era, put out a tweet, you know, happy birthday to George's son. And I wanted to write back, actually, my name's Callum, but I didn't because I get it. You know I mean? I, even when the Manchester United lads are singing, you know, go on the piss with Georgie best. It's like, they're singing about something that my old man died from, but I still respect the fact that they're singing because they're supporting my old man. So I take it on board and I love it. And I appreciate it. Because they're not doing it derogatory. Yeah, exactly. Doing a form of honor. uh, Exactly. And I love it. So I hear that song. I sing it myself. I get involved fully, but it's like, you know, there was this pattern at one point where I felt so many times I needed to express the fact that I was proud to be my dad's son. And finally, I'm like, God, that's obvious. You know, I am. I love my dad to bits. Yeah. Horrible father in many, many ways, but I know he meant well, but he had an illness and I've learned so much about the illness over so many years. I've become such an advocate about how to try to teach kids and families and anybody affected by it, how to cope and how to deal with it. It's one of my biggest passions in life. Is that how to cope and how to deal with, as in, if you have a parent or a guardian that happens to be... Uh, yeah, I guess it's or, major- or both, it, it, or, or is if is if you drink yourself, is it both? No, it's not from drinking myself because yeah. I actually never had a problem. My problem yeah. was just I was lost. You know, right. I was just going down the wrong path and didn't know what to do. I didn't know who I was as a person. I lacked self belief. I was just all over the place. Like, what is my purpose here? Never knew it. You know, and I never knew I had a passion for anything until I started talking about the trauma that I went through. And by talking about what I went through is where I found my passion and a lot of purpose. Because what's the name of the charity again? It's um, NACOA, yeah. National Organization of Children of Alcoholics. And I found them by making this documentary. When I was 27, these documentary makers came to me and they said, we make really serious stuff on cancer and poverty and we want to do one on alcohol in the UK. We think you'd be a perfect ambassador. I was like, yeah, I'm sure you do. <laughs> Not sure I'm ready for this right now, but you know what? The universe has brought these to me. I'm a massive believer in how the universe works. I I grabbed it with both hands and I was so fragile and I was all over the place. And I remember halfway through it, we went to film in Manchester and I chose to go out on a massive session, showed up the next day, still pissed. But it, you know, it was a, it was a point where I had to do it at the time because I knew that it came to me for a good reason. Right. So I went, I filmed this documentary. I went to Bristol to film one day with a charity called Nakoa. walked in there. There was five people in a room on the phone lines. One woman that ran it named Hillary Enriquez. She's now become a really good friend of mine. We work closely. I've climbed Mount Blanc for them. I have run the London Marathon twice. I've created a football charity game called... Yeah, your football charity as well. So you yeah. now you're building that up. I suppose yeah. it's very similar to Soccer Aiden, but for your charity, essentially. Well, that's where I want to go with it. It's called My Tribute. It's a kind of respect to my old man, but also something that is my own. And uh, it's for NACOA, National Organization of Children of Alcoholics. And I launched it in Belfast. I thought very suiting place. Windsor Park and I remember when I got there on the day the last time I was in Windsor Park was for my dad's memorial game when I was like seven years old and there's like a picture of me in the green kit and him holding me in his arms it's really really lovely resonating stuff you know 
So I launched it last year. Um, the IFA, Irish Football Association, is the partnership there. It's for their foundation as well. Last year we did it. We got 7,000 people down. I called wow. them, I called amongst all my friends from entertainment, music, reality, whatever it may be. And now we've just confirmed the second one to be this year on May 3rd in Belfast again. And I want to grow that to similar as Soccer Aid did. I'm a go-getter. I'm a goal-getter. I'm nonstop now. It's, my charity work means so much to me. And I'm mixing in the fact of football is there. And I love football as well. <laughs> and that's another thing, mate. Just to, to stray off into a different one. I, in America, started playing football at 13. Realized I loved it. Realized I was all right at it. Realized I was really good at it. And sometimes I was like, God, if I so when you So when you say you played football in America, you mean the real football, not so- oh, you yeah. mean soccer, I mean as soccer. they call it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, fine. I mean football. <laughs> yeah, I call it football, football, not American football. No. So I started playing, realized I was quite good. I remember one day my old man was like, oh, I'm coming over and I'll teach the kids. And he showed up in his shell suit with his scrappy hair. And I was like, no, no, I swear, guys, he used to be a really good footballer. (laughs) And he's like looking at absolute state, right? But so anyway, when I moved to the UK, the pressures of being my dad's son made me stop playing football. And I stopped for 10 years, right? And there's this guy named Kevin Cooper who created a company, really cool. I'll put you in touch with him because I know you love your football as well, called Celebrity with an S. And he does celebrity charity football games all over the UK at all different grounds. He was on my case. Callum, come. Callum, come. No, no, no. I don't want it. I don't want it. Reached an age when I was probably 29. Yeah. And I went, you know what? Forget what everybody thinks. I've been playing five aside quietly with my friends. I've got my passion back. I absolutely love it. I went out to the first game. I think it was West Brom or something like that in front of a crowd of 15,000 people. And I went, my captain the side and I scored and I was like, yes, <laughs> got the buzz back. And ever since then, I've been playing my charity games. So I wanted to create my own, created my tribute. Belfast welcomed it with open arms and it's just going to go from strength to strength to strength. And my end goal is to just have a packed stadium similar to Soccer Aid and just doing my own thing. But your focus is so different when you think about you know, your father's focus and your, I mean, you had an illness, so I appreciate Mm, that. mm. But now health, mental health and physical health is very much on your agenda. Both of those things. I mean, you have a a journal, you encourage people to write something down. Is it like a daily thing? Yeah. So how it came about was first I started talking about alcohol in the family. When I started getting responses that were positive to that, I was like, ah, this, first of all, feels good. And second of all, I'm onto something here. So I started talking more and more and more. And I started using my Instagram as a tool. I started using the morning chat shows as a tool to express my thoughts and my feelings. And I had a platform. I was the son of one of the biggest legends ever. And I also had created a name for myself doing various TVs. I mean, the name I created at the beginning wasn't the best. But now people actually, I feel, you know, some still don't get where I come from. But the people that matter to me now do, right? And so I go on the morning chat shows. I talk about mental health because I talk about my journey. I just talk about what I've been through and the platform that I have is an epic platform to have, you know, and alcohol is a huge thing here. So I started with alcohol and it turned into, you know, thinking I wasn't going to make it till 30. Then it, then it was what tools that I used to come out of that darkness. And I talk about manifesting and visualizing and goal setting and juicing and fitness and training because that's something I'm really passionate about. And as soon as I started talking about all these things, next thing you know, I'm on stage in front of 3000 people and I'm like, ah, found a bit of a calling here. I really, really like it. And now if you were to go on my Instagram, don't get me wrong. I'm no saint. I still enjoy myself. I'll still have a session in Ibiza with friends. I'll still go down to get pissed at a restaurant if I want with my friends. But overall, my goal is to express the things that I went through and say, because it was traumatic stuff, you know, like there was a point where I was sitting with, without to get too depressing, I remember sitting with my mom, you know, saying, I don't think I'm going to make it till 30 and her crying. And I look back at that now and I'm like, holy goodness me, how did it get to that point? So I just use a personal story. And when you talk to other people about personal issues, it resonates tenfold. So what advice would you give to someone? Because your journal, like you said, is it to just have a bit of mindfulness Sorry, I day? probably went off on a no, tangent fine, there. But is it something like to, to have a bit of mindfulness every day? Yes. Uh, what would you say to, to just tune in? Because mm. you're always doing something that's either going to take you further towards what you ultimately want mm. or further away. Yeah. Whatever decision you ever make at that given moment, you've mm. got to ask, or oh, I always think, ask yourself the question, mm. am I getting further towards my goal or further away from my goal or so on? So is gratitude something yeah. you teach? For sure. Stuff like that. So my approach, I mean, it's very much business minded, but it's even more so spiritual, universal, holistic, right? I come from a place that isn't ruthless, isn't cutthroat in business. It's like be kind, do well, be mindful, do things with a pure heart and a best intention. As soon as you start doing that, and I know you agree with me on these things, you start coming at things from that approach. It's all going to unfold how it should unfold. It does anyway. A lot of people, we were talking about this actually early, wasn't it, before we've come on. I was just talking about just business in general, that actually if you come to it with a heart initially, in Mm. other words, you have a passion and that's why you're doing something, money does follow, even if you didn't want it to follow, it just inevitably happens because I think if you're doing something good, inevitably 
whether it's the universe or something else, yeah. it rewards you along the way and you, you almost can't help it. I think it? so too. And I think people obviously over the years and still do make money by being ruthless and being cutthroat. It's just not my forte. I want something that is good and pure and genuine. And I feel that way. And I believe in karma. I believe in all that stuff. And my journal was a kind of build up to all these kind of things I'd had stored in my brain. And I, I found this little niche market and I went, all right, I don't journal, but how can I put something on paper to help people? And I started doing it myself. I started in the morning. And what I did was I based my journal on mindfulness and productivity. Okay. Yeah? So on the left-hand side was the productivity side where you track your day. And on the right-hand side, you wake up, you practice your gratitude, three things you're grateful for. Halfway through the day, you have a little mindful moment. Then in the evening, you reflect and you talk about all your wins. And as soon as you started practicing gratitude and appreciating what you've got and setting some goals for yourself, I know my life changed for the better, you know? Um, I think gratitude is underrated in yeah. a way. It is the number one thing, especially in our Instagram world at the moment. It's so easy to have FOMO as people have the fear of missing out and, and people get very jealous essentially when they're looking through Instagram. But if we just took a moment, mm. even one moment every day, like you said, and just said, yeah, but what am I grateful for? Yeah. And there are a million things yeah. in the moment to ever feel grateful for. And again, that's part of mental health. And if you have a reason to then want to essentially get up and live and like life, then you're more likely to have good physical health. Yeah. Because actually you do physical health stuff now, whether it's juicing and fitness and everything else. Yeah. Because like you said, you want to live longer. You want to look good. You yeah. want to, I mean, you know, what was the main rationale? I mean, give me a day. In, I'll tell you what I like. I always ask people this. Mm. A day in the life of. So you go, a norm, not a weekend day, not an Ibiza day, <laughs> yeah. right? Well, I'm I get on the jet, yeah, <laughs> yeah. and I just yeah. Yeah, head for some I, sushi. I, I'm talking, and then... I'm, I don't mean you and Wayne on yeah, the jet. Yeah, I'm yeah. talking about, right, a day in the life of a normal, like, I don't know, maybe 70% of the time. I get it. Because, you know, so what would you, you wake up and do what? I mean, because a lot of people just like to follow what somebody's doing because mm. go, well, it's working for them. Mm. I'm just going to follow in their, in their footpath. Well, so I will say a massive part of my day every day is training and juicing. I wake up in the morning, I've got my juicer in the corner, and for the past, let's just say, I'll give it a time frame, for the past nine months, every single morning, I've woke up, I've juiced celery, a lemon or a lime, and ginger. And that's how I start my day. But before I drink that, I usually train fasted. My physique, like I said, 39 yesterday, I'm in the best shape I've ever been in my life. And I put it down to these little hacks and these little things that, you know, we discussed this earlier, but everybody's got an opinion on the best way to train and the best way to juice and the best things to put inside you. You've just got to try a few of these things until you find the one that works for you. And me is juicing. I juice every single day and I feel like I'm lacking my nutrients if I don't and also training as well. I started with the training. So I reached a point where I went, ooh, what can I do to start feeling better? I'll start going to the gym. When I put some structure in my life, it started to get a bit better. My physique started to change, gave me a bit more self-confidence, which led to what other avenues are similar to training for the brain you know, for the gut, for the mental health side. So it's like you pick one little niche and it just opens up all these other doors. And it was, it's a great example that you used of passing the juice on, or passing it forward, I think you yeah, said, juicy with your forward. juicer. Yeah, juicy you forward, just do yeah. these things for yourself to try to benefit because so much of my life, I'm like trying to please other people and I'm trying to make sure everybody understands and all this rubbish. All due respect, I actually quite like that moment, but it's about... You know, you can't be trying to help others when your glass is half empty. You got to make sure that you are firing on cylinders. And but it's funny, so many people do, and I think that's really important because you have a passion to help people. But yeah. it's funny, I always have a saying: I wouldn't take financial advice from somebody who's skint. Yeah. And it's interesting that some people would take health advice from somebody who clearly isn't healthy or a picture of health. But some people do, and I know, yeah. I understand. You haven't got to be the best football player in order to be the best football manager. What are you trying to say? I understand. <laughs> you probably are uh, to be the best football manager. I understand that, but you at least have to have kicked a ball somewhere. Yeah. along the line and so there's some credibility clearly in what you're doing but also you you want to do it there's a lot of similarities it's funny over the years for those who don't know Callum even came to the premiere of Super Juice Me Love it. Um, in Leicester Square when was that? Called. that was uh, about seven six years ago I'm wow. looking around at some of the team that's here about 20 30 yeah, nice. so, he knows so, his stuff seven, seven years ago well he, he did the movie oh, so we're, we're, we're round of applause we're actually Yay. in the room with the person and Alex Lee who made the movie here everybody as well so you came to the premiere of Super Juice which was uh, incredible and it just went nuts from there. Mm. But it's only in the last few years that I've noticed that there's a lot of similarities. So so your mum and my mum, weirdly, right, mm. were Playboy bunnies, right? <laughs> around, around the thing. My mum was into health before anybody else. She read books like Back to Eden, was searching for wholemeal bread before people even knew what wholemeal bread was. Yeah. So that's a, a huge similarity there. Yeah. But also during the day, most of the time, you don't eat during the day. Yeah. 
and you have like one meal, yeah. you know, the night, but you tend to have liquid fuel yep. as the day goes on. And you also fast exercise. So you're up like yep. that. You then do some exercise on no food, yep. as I do. Then you have your juice Nutrients. or whatever the case yep. is. And then as the day goes on, yep. and you found in the last nine months, that's been pretty much your, yep. your, your thing. And e- even longer than that, I just remember we, we were discussing earlier on, on my podcast about this celery thing, and I don't want to get too into it, but I, I started that bit. You know, I started thinking – all right, somebody said that the celery was going to help me, you know, first thing in the morning, if it's done consistently, you can shed a lot of pounds. And I was like, you know what, I'll give it a go. And it's actually leaned me out completely. I mean, that on top of training my ass off, you know, but there's at the same time, I can't go a day without thinking I need to put some sort of nutrient in my body. Because I would say as well, as we discussed before, but I would say that if somebody said have cucumber juice yeah. and some lemon and some yeah. ginger, would have done the same, same thing. thing. The, the point is what we're looking at is liquid fuel, yes. liquid nutrition yes. coming in and a spectrum of color. I know there's been a lot of thing going on about the celery juice yeah. uh, craze and it doesn't do any harm yeah. there's certainly about 16 ounces that can often um, I'm, not, I'm not drinking throat. that much we discussed the bases and what I do now because it's just become the norm and I actually you know I feel good the skin's good the eyes are white the hair's good the nails are good all these benefits you, you, know, you need to do you need to actually boost your confidence a bit that's I know, you, right? No, no, you do. You need Mate, to. You gotta, no, someone, honestly, someone's no. got to love me, yeah? Listen, someone's got to love me, you Jason. Gotta you got to imagine, <laughs> 10 years ago, I would walk down the street and I would not make eye contact because really? I thought people hated me. Seriously, was it that bad? I, it was Did that it bad. That I would bad? not look people in the eyes. I would stare at the floor as I walked along because I looked up. I think they would look at me and go, there's that prick, Callum. They probably still do. Don't get me wrong. No, but, but it's funny, though, because a lot of people do have this funny image. And I told you, when you was on Big Brother, it was yeah. the first time ever, because I was guilty of it. I'll be on. I've got my honest I still get it to this day. But I did pigeonhole you in, yeah. a, in an area and I think a lot of people did and it was seeing you have a normal conversation on Big Brother because you do forget cameras there I, used to, I, I did a show very similar to it years and years ago and people say oh you always know you don't you do forget you yeah. actually do forget there's cameras yeah. and you genuinely were just sitting down having this genuine conversation about you that about how you felt about this and all of a sudden I saw a very very different yeah. Callum but in other words like you said I saw the real Callum yeah. best. and like you said about, about right I freaking love myself this is damn right well, I, I, do. I, I don't but you know what I do I, have, I, I speak with such conviction and, and confidence about certain subjects and I'm proud of that because it's taken me a long point to get there you know and when I talk about no no I know about this if you were looking for advice I can speak passionately with conviction about it it's not about everything like I mean, overall, I'll probably leave here and be so insecure that I'll check myself out in the mirror on the way, you know, so stuff like that is fully still resonates. And there's all sorts of stresses and anxieties still that go on without a doubt. But overall, when it comes to this kind of health life and this kind of wanting to help people feel better and be better because I know the struggle. I mean, we all have struggles, so I'm not saying, whoa, me. I'm just saying, God, I got a platform. I'm going to use it for the best that I can. I've got a social media. I'm going to try to influence well. So if somebody is struggling out there, so let's just say they are potentially in a home where there's somebody who drinks very heavily, mm. or conversely, they're just struggling with their own weight, they're doing this, whatever the case is, yeah. three take-homes, right? So is there anything you can go, three things that, that you might go, actually, just do that, do that, do that. Not saying it's a cure-all, yeah. but actually this will help. Of course. I mean, just to say that I think there are a lot of people out here that love this stuff. I mean, a lot of people are doing podcasts and teaching life lessons and all that stuff. But you know what? The more help, the better. Why not? You know what I mean? Why not try to help people feel and do better? And I'm, I actually get so annoyed sometimes about people saying, oh, you know, just man up and deal with it. It's like, no, if people are struggling, like reach out. So one of them would be, do not be afraid to open up and talk about it, right? Because if you keep these things inside, they will eat away at you. So I can't preach go to a therapist because I don't, but I find ways to get it out and talk about it in my own ways, right? Because that is a form of therapy in itself. I always say that's people as well. Yes. The, the fact that you Journal. You there you confine. go. Journal. Get, yeah, get something, something get out. It out. Get, get it out. out. Even if you've got no one to actually talk yeah. to, you can still get it you out. You can still put something on paper. You can still express what's going on inside so it doesn't eat away at your gut and it doesn't eat away at your sure. brain. I would say a massive part is moving and training without a doubt. I know it's a, it's a regular and everybody would say the same thing, but you know, the endorphins you get, you know, I, I go to the gym in the morning to do a spin class and I have so many things to say on this as well. If you're uncomfortable going to the gym because you care what people think, then go find a class. Maybe go find a class because everybody's in that class for the same reason of wanting to better themselves. And if I see you in there, I'm going to be rooting for you. So not everybody's in there judging you. You know what I mean? I, not, do you know, I always say to people, anybody in the gym, if yeah. you walk in, no one's actually judging. No, you. everyone's just they trying look, to get their they, own thing they, done. And you know? also they're looking at you thinking, well, well done you for coming I do. I look at people and sometimes I actually have to stop myself because somebody else be sitting next to me and bless them they'll be out of shape but I'll see him pushing and I want to reach over and I want to slap him high five and say well done but then I don't want them to think I'm being patronizing no, it's a hard so one, I don't you know yeah, of course, yeah, but yeah. sometimes you do but, some, but you've got to figure out in the moment so I would say get active I would say 
talk about it. And you know what? Because I'm here and I'm a strong believer and I have already had two today, I would say juice. I would say if you can't eat your veg as much as you can, get them in a juicer. Somebody messaged me the other day and just said, I'm really struggling. My diet's really poor. I'm eating this crap. And I'm like, well, listen, just go buy a juicer for 30, 40 quid. I know it's a lot of money, but invest in your health. Buy a juicer, put some veg in your fridge, give it a go. What do you have to lose besides feeling better? Well, that's it. Sums it up, doesn't it? That's it. That's what we need to know. So get stuff out, yep. obviously mentally. Yep. Get stuff in physically in, in a juice form and get the body moving. Exactly. Okay, there are three. That's it. Sometimes the simplicity is all we need. Callum, we're going to have to pick this up on another pocket because I had a load of stuff here. I've got, <laughs> you can't see it. There's so much stuff. Well, as you can tell, I talk and, for days. Uh, well, so. you're like me. You can talk for England as well at the same time, which is which is good. Listen, good luck with your charities. People look it up. Look him up. What's your Instagram, by the way? Mr. What's, Callum Best. Mr. Callum Best on Instagram. Website, can they find you somewhere? No, that'll do. That'll do. The, yeah. Everything's there on there. It's all, it's all on there. Everything's on there. And but everything's no, Instagram, I, I've got everything. I've got my crystals business. I've got my journal business. I've got my charity. So the things are flying and, and it's an absolute pleasure coming in and see you. And I'm, you know, we've known each other all these years and it's nice to finally sit down and kind of be able to collab on something. So you yeah. came to my podcast. I'm here at yours. I know. And I that love was it. funny as well. Because actually, those who don't know, I've literally, we just recorded Callum's, me on Callum's podcast yeah. before this, which is why sometimes if we've made any reference to, oh, and we've just been talking about that. But yeah. actually, you we what you're talking, you're going to have to listen to Callum. So if you listen to Callum's podcast on Global, <laughs> right, then you would hear what went on just before. Actually, that's worth doing. Because actually, that's why there was some crossover along the way. But to say that Callum's introducing, there's no exaggeration. I mean, this no. guy, I would say he's almost as passionate as I am about juicing. Whenever you see him, he's trying to get so many people juicing. Can't thank you enough for coming on. I would say the real Callum Best. Ladies and gentlemen. Hey.